So how did you end up working on their debut EP, Other Worlds? It's the short way to do this. Um, <laughs> I was working on something in the control room. And At which studio, if I may ask? This is Velvetone. Okay. This is my friend Sam Albright. Had a business downstairs that he ran for his father, and then upstairs was just up for grabs. It was an old Gold Rush hotel that had been a fire and burned everything out, so they're rebuilding it from the ground up right next to the railroad train. So this is how Ellensburg got to Seattle in the old days. And yeah, so I, by this point, I'd moved back to Ellensburg and the engineer that had been working there was getting ready to leave and go to New York. He had built a place, he split, and then all of a sudden I was there. And, you know, I knew how to run a four track hmm. and I knew how to run a synthesizer studio. I did not know how to record a rock band. Hmm. Gary Lee Connor came in, you know, so we said, Gary Lee Connor wants to talk to you. I think they called him Lee Connor. I think we knew him as Lee Connor back okay. then. And he came in and was a little nervous, but asked, you know, if, you know, those screaming trees could record there. Of course, we said yes. And Sam was starting a label at the same time. Uh, and the screaming trees ended up being the second band on the label. The other world session uh, was probably, I don't know, remember more vividly than some of the other ones, just because it happened so quickly. Huh. Um, they went out in this huge studio. The studio was big. It had a very high ceiling. It was as trapezoidal. Uh, beautiful mitered wood floor and then carpeting. So on different surfaces, just a, a great place to record. And they set up facing the control room like we were looking at them on stage. So they just set up like the screaming trees and just blew the set down. Hmm. I, uh, I think we stopped the tape, but they pretty much just played it as is. And then Mark, you know, redid the vocals and I played some keyboards on it. And I think we had it mixed like within a week or something like that. We came back for some of it up so then mixed the record. And then, yeah, it became, a, they put out a cassette originally. So it was this little red cassette with somebody that looks like Mark Lanigan on the cover, but it isn't. It's a really? Silhouette. Yes. Oh, yeah, you, what's see, the story if there? If you see the other worlds, yeah, you can Google other worlds and see this. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's something Mark Lanigan would never do. It's like, you know, he's in a forest holding a wand, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, that's but funny. I'm sure it's something Gary Lee found. It's like, oh, that's great. That looks like Lanigan. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So so what did you think of the, I guess, when you were in studio with the band, at what point did it? Did you feel like, oh, this is a good band? Like, was it during the recording? Was it when you finished the EP? When was that kind of moment for you when you first started to like them? The minute they started playing. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, because they were a great, great live band. And I don't think they had had a lot of live experience. I think they'd only played one gig at this point, but they, they really had their, their thing together. And their thing together, the thing that they understood was that to do the kind of music they wanted to do, you had to perform it. You had to grab it by the neck, you know, and just be that thing, you know. So they knew how to do that. They were totally uninhibited. And, and also melodic. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is, you know, Gary Lee, you know, this, this, I mean, this is a compliment, but he had form down, you know, mm -hmm. he knew how to write that kind of song. He knew that time period and that style of music and he knew what he loved out of it. And so it was very easy for him to, to you know, you know, say, all right, you do this, you do this, you do this. And then Van does what he does anyway, because they're brothers. He's not going to listen to his brother. <laughs> And, uh, and Mark Lanigan, you know, just brought it, you know, and, you know, you can hear it over the records. I mean, he kind of turned into Mark Lanigan by, you know, Invisible Lantern, you know. Yeah, for sure. But he, he was, but he was, you know, I don't listen to the Screaming Trees records for a million reasons, which I can't really describe here, but, you know, they're all tied to this giant nightmare that was the late 80s into the 90s. So I don't spend a lot of time with the records, but I've been listening to them a little bit, uh, getting ready to, to come to this interview and that's the one why does an other world sound perfect why does clairvoyant sound this good i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> you know sam had a lot to do with showing me how to run his studio uh the session i'd done right before this was a country western session with a, some reasonably pro players from yakima and so that's oh. kind of easy to get right there's no big level surges nothing goes wild it's just country guys in a room mm. And, and I basically used the same setup to record other worlds, you know, which meant that I was, you know, compressing the mics, through the low rent compressors we had available and are somewhat uh, 
okay, but not top of the line equipment we had to work with. So I don't want to sound like a snob. I was very happy to be working there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I did a lot of sort of smashing everything and, and tweaking everything on the way in. Uh, and then clairvoyance, I was even more worried about making something good, knowing that the screaming trees are now being listened to, just the cassette got them a lot of attention. And that was this, a whole thing where the drums are tracked across five channels and then bounced down to two channels using a DVX noise uh, encoding thing, which is a real old fashioned trick. But the point was the drums sound huge and have this kind of pumping quality that has to do with the encoding playback. Uh, but it also means that you have to work to that drum balance for the rest of the mix it means that the kick and the snare can't change levels. Gotcha. You can make it brighter, you can make it duller, but the decisions you made early on, you made. And the engineer that was leaving, um, before he left, uh, we had this amazing early digital reverb, uh, a Lexicon 200, hmm. which people kind of laugh at now, but I think the earlier digital technology, it, it didn't have all the precision in the high end, so it made it milkier and deeper and you know, more like Joy Division or something like that. So, you know, I printed all that crap on the drums on clairvoyance. So that made the clairvoyance drum sound kind of big and FM radio and not psychedelic and might be like the biggest drum sound I'd made in my career up till then, you know, so cool. and then everybody chimed in and put their shit on top of it. But it's an eight track. So it's always a matter of negotiating space. All the Screaming Trees records I work on were eight track. Hmm. Um, I think, uh, Jack and Dino, when he recorded uh, their record, uh, Buzz they were, uh, yeah, I think I think there were sixteen by that point, but they just gone sixteen. In the early days, everybody was on eight track, which is an interesting thing to talk about. I mentioned this in other interviews. Um, the half inch eight track, especially the Otari MX fifty fifty P, that was what was in all of these low rent studios that everybody was recording in, and there's a sound to it, and it's a good sound. The thing that's good about Atari Pro Dex is in this is in this this the small machine. So if you hit it extra hard, something magic happens. To something, something, something instead of something stupid happening, like what happens with a Tascam machine. Gotcha. So Dinosaur Junior were working on that. Screaming Trees were working on that format. Soundgarden was working on that format. Mud Honey was working on that format. So so listening to a record with that means you're you're kind of that's old school. That means you're making a lot of decisions ahead of time and saying, okay, we can't change this. We're recording this. We're going to build on top of it. You know, this is like what the Beatles did, you know, except, you know, we didn't have a machine to bounce to, but it's a whole other way of working. And that magical kind of distortion, the kind of friendly clipping you get with the Otari is also a, a link and tape because tape's gone now. So you can definitely hear the yeah. sound of, of the half inch tape across all those records. I forget, I think it's on bug. There's one place on bug where the overdubs stop and it just turns into a three piece and they jam out for a while. And it just magically sounds like, uh, it sounds like the clairvoyance track on the clairvoyance yeah. record, that slow, fast, slow yeah. uh, thing at the end of side two. Yeah. And it's like, it was like, fuck, this sounds exactly like the screaming trees. Because it all of a sudden it was a three piece just rocking out in the room, you know, recorded on a you know half inch eight track, you know. 